well, before I get into the Bible, I, I, I got to set some, some ground rules, some ground rules. <laughs> if you were here last Sunday, I set some ground rules for the sermon. Uh, in love, sex, and marriage, um, I'm, I'm going to try and use all my time today. So I'm not going to do a sermon recap. I usually do a sermon recap, um, and I'm not going to do that today. Uh, uh, today, I'm just going to let you know what we're talking about. We're in week three of this series, and the title of today's sermon is At Last. At Last. At Last. And in case you don't know what this means, I have another sermon title slide that will let you know what this means. And so this is it. That's the right there. So... Winky face emoji, you know what I'm talking about? At last, um, we're talking about sex. Let's talk about sex journey. All right, let's do that. So we're going to be talking about it, and I need everybody to relax. As soon as I said sex, everybody got tight booty. Don't be tight. Relax. All right, just breathe. It's going to be good. Just chill out. This is an okay topic. It's a great topic to talk about, and we need to talk about it in church because your kids are hearing it everywhere else. But here, and so we need to talk about it here. If, if it gets awkward, if you start sweating, if you want to leave, that just means it's working, okay? <laughs> it just means it's working. Don't go nowhere. Let it do what it's supposed to do. And so I'm going to say the ground rules, and then I'm going to pray. And I want to give you a heads up. The prayer is really an opportunity for every parent with young children in here to get them to journey kids, okay? It'll be a 30-second prayer, and that is a 30-second window for you to remove them from this facility. However, if they are a middle school or high school, I think they need to be here. You get them here right now. In fact, we got Journey Youth up on the balcony along with some other people in the balcony. And I'm so glad you're here because that's going to bless you. All right, ground rules. Ground rule number one, listen for yourself. Do not, this is not for your neighbor. This is for you, especially the husbands. I'm going to say some stuff today and the wives. It's not for your neighbor. This is for you. And the second, I said this, I gave, I gave this ground rule last week. I need to give it today even more. It's more important. I want to be talking about some things about sex. And, and when I talk about sex, there's some things that maybe you didn't live up to. Maybe some things that you, the Bible teaches us we should have done that you didn't do. Here's the second rule. You have to listen to this like if you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Whatever you've experienced up until this point, I need you to put it in your back pocket, get it behind you, and listen like a, like a from this day forward mentality. Whatever happened in my life up until here, it was that. But from this day forward, it's a different deal. It's a different situation because I'm a new and different person in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, here's the window, parents. This is your opportunity to get them out of here. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We need you so much to be in this room today because we can't talk about this topic without you. You're in this, and I believe you want to deliver. I believe you want to set free. I believe you want to break chains. I believe you want to rescue. I believe you want to redeem a topic that has been shunned and shamed by the church for so long. Um, but this was your idea. And so we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone says amen. All right, where did we get the title at last from? Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 24. It says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. And he gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. In verse 23, look at what the man said. He said, at last, the man exclaimed. He didn't whisper. He didn't, he didn't subtly, you know, speak it or hush it. He exclaimed it, at last. Translation, God made the woman, and Adam said, Dang! Girl, you fine. <laughs> That's why he said, just like that. That's just the JJ version, JJV of this right here. <laughs> this is why he said, Dang! She bone from my bone. <laughs> and flesh from my flesh. So she will be called woman because she was taken from the man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Now we have to go back a chapter to see what happens next. 
it's a chapter behind, but it's next in chronology. So Genesis 1, 27. This is the next thing that happens. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God, ooh, blessed. Somebody say blessed. blessed. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. I used to think that the last thing God created in all of creation was woman because she was the cherry on top of creation. She was like, doesn't get no better than this, girl, you fine. But in reality, the last thing God created, if we're looking at it chronologically, was not the woman, but the, 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 the mechanism, the, 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 I don't know what to call it, sex, okay? The inner course, the exchange. The last thing God made was sex. That's what he said when he was saying be fruitful and multiply, okay? He wasn't talking about agriculture or arithmetic, okay? <laughs> he was saying, Adam, lay it down, all right? Get that, get that, all right? In Jesus' name. That's what he said. Because he said, hey, you think I'm playing? He said he blessed them. It was a blessing. I have to hit this point so hard because I need to tell you today that sex is good. Wow. <laughs> if there was ever a moment to say amen in church, that was it right there. Sex is good. Amen. amen. The virgins are like, I don't. I mean, it's what they tell me. I don't know. What do you want to say amen to that? I don't know. That's <laughs> what so he says. And here's why it's not only just good, listen, it's a gift. I think that's why he brought it to the end of creation. My son just had a birthday party yesterday, and guess what we did at the end of his birthday party? We opened gifts. Gifts traditionally and symbolically come at the end. I think the reason why God made Adam wait, mind you, he made Adam wait, then he made the woman, then he made sex, because he was trying to teach Adam this is a gift to be blessed upon you. This is a gift. I'm giving it to you. Sex is good. Sex is a gift. And it's important to know that sex is good and sex is a gift because it changes the way you see God. When you know that God created it, when you know that God made it, it changes the way you see God. What, does, what do Elvis Presley, Elton John, Frank Sinatra, Diana Ross, Whitney Houston, and Rihanna all have in common? None of them write their own songs. <laughs> True story. If Google is to be believed, it is a true story. Yet they get credit for the songs that other people wrote because they sing it. Listen, I know that the world is singing the song of sex, but I want you to know they are singing a song that they didn't write. And it's time to bring credit where credit is due. And I just think we need to take credit back from the magazines. We need to take credit back from the movies. We need to take credit back from the media and the websites. And you can sing the song, but you are singing a song you did not write. My God came up with this idea because he's a good God. And it changes the way you see him. Because I don't know about you, but when I think of sex, God is the last person <laughs> I think about. The last person. Except, you know, when I'm like, oh, God. But anyway, better than that, he's the last. He's the, it's going to get real. It's the last person I think about. And I need to redeem the topic. Because some of you think that God is this old man with the beard and glasses and a stick. And he's going to hit you if you have one sexual thought that pop you on the head. And you need to know that he invented the whole thing. Don't believe Trey songs. It's a lie. He didn't invent sex. God invented this thing. It's his idea. It was his thought. It was his gift to humanity. Pound it, Jesus. Way to go. Give him props where props are due. It was, you have a, I just want you to know we have a good God who doesn't get mad at you because you have sexual desires and urges. He put them there. That's like radical for you to even concept, like to think about, because you never talked about it in church. But it's true. Not only does it change the way you see God, it's important to know that God invented sex because when you know that God invented sex, it changes the way you see sex. Because if you want to see how something operates or how something works, here's what you do. You go to the person who invented it. You go to the person that made it. No one knows how something operates more than the person who created it, right? And so he made it. That's why, I don't know if it's because I'm a youth pastor or I was a youth pastor, 
and I was exposed to a lot of teenagers and even preteens struggling with sexual sin and struggling with sexual issues at a very young age. It freaked me out. When I became a parent, I always told Liz before we even had a kid, I said, we need to have the conversation with our kid at a young age because it seems like younger and younger and younger, they're discovering these things and you could try and protect them all you want, but eventually they're going to have friends and eventually they're going to go on the internet and eventually things are going to happen. So I always told her that we would have this conversation at around eight years old, eight years old. Well, remember that birthday party I was telling you about? Yesterday, Justice just turned eight years old. And so pray for your boy. Pray for your pastor. I'm going to have to have this conversation soon and uh, somewhere in the next two months. And some of you are thinking, why? Why do you want to have this conversation so soon? I don't want to have the conversation so soon. I just need to beat his friends to it. I just need to beat the internet to it. I just need to beat the movies to it. I just need to beat the music to it. I just need to be the first voice. Because here's what I found out. It's the first voice that we hear that we often interpret as truth. You know that the truth that you experience to be true oftentimes is not true because it's true. Bear with me. Oftentimes the truth that we believe to be true is true because of what we experienced, heard, or saw first. Whoever gets in first is the one that gets to define. So I'm just trying to be first. And I'll give you another way of explaining this. Would you hand me those real quick? Um, how many people know uh, what these are and use them on a regular basis? Q-tips. Come on. How many people use Q-tips? Raise your hand. All right. Aside from sex, I don't know if there's a better feeling. <laughs> you come out of the shower. Am I talking? Am I, am I speaking the truth or what? And you get up in there and you're like, oh, my God. That's so good. So good. Raise your hand if you've ever done that before. You've ever used Q-tips in that way. Raise your hand high. Hi. It's, I'm going to ask you if you sin. Just raise your hand high. But if you, if you use Q-tips, can we be interactive today? Okay, great. 90% of us use Q-tips. The other 10, dirty ear canals. But use <laughs> three tips. That's awesome. That's awesome that we do that. There's only one problem. If you read the side of the box... In really big letters, it says, warning, do not insert swab into ear canal. Entering the ear canal could cause injury if used to clean ears. True story. Do you know that 34 people a day get sent to the injury, get sent to the emergency room because they injured themselves using Q-tips? True story. How many people raise your hand? You've never heard that before. How many people, you, you knew that? But you still do it anyway. You don't care. I'm supposed to that. And you know why you do it? Because you're used to it. Because you've been doing it so long, it's become a habit. And it's injuring you. But Q-tips aren't the problem. We're the problem because we're using them in a way the manufacturer did not design it to be used. <laughs> sex is not the problem. I'm tired of pastors and preachers bashing sex. Sex is good. But when we use it in a way that it was not created or designed to be used... We get injured. And the reason why we're using it that way is the same reason why we, we use Q-tips that way. Because this is how our mom taught us how it was supposed to be used. We saw someone when we were younger do this. And so we did it. Are you, are you catching me? It's because of the way we were exposed to it first. I think the reason why we're being injured with sex is because of the way that we were introduced to it at first. Some of y'all didn't hear your, sex conversa your first sex conversation from a pulpit. Like a lot of people, in the, maybe the youth are able to hear today. Some of y'all heard your, had your first sex conversation. This is why you got hurt. Because you had your first sex conversation in the back of a school bus from a, from a fifth grader named Billy, whose only qualification to talk on the topic is that he is born because his parents had sex. That's the only qualification that he had. And you got your information from him. Some of y'all are gotten injured by sex because you got your lesson from an MTV music video. TRL, Total Request Live. Come on, we've been on that back in the day. Some of you got injured with sex because you were introduced to it by an older family member who told you that this is how we show love to each other. It's totally normal to be touched here. It's totally normal to touch there. That was your introduction. Some of you got your purity stolen from you. That was your introduction to this topic. It's no wonder why we have so many jacked up concepts. It's so no wonder why, why, we, why so many of us experience pain through this thing. Because sex, guys, sex, this is the lie. This is why it's so important to get the definition right and to go back to God's definition. Because sex is not just physical. When it hurts us, it hurts us on a spiritual and emotional level. This is like the biggest lie that the world will try and tell us about sex. 
This is what they want you to believe. Hear me. That you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. So let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> hey, it's just two mammals doing what two mammals do. And as long as nobody gets pregnant, as long as nobody catches an STD, as long as nobody gets hurt, then it's all right. But if that's true, then how come you can't remember what you had for breakfast this morning, but you can't remember that night like it was last night? I mean, they're both physical, right? They're both meeting needs. And so if it's just physical, then it shouldn't have the same life. But something on an emotional level recalls that moment. If it's just physical, then why are women like incredibly less likely to report rape than they are just regular physical abuse? I mean, it's just, it's just like getting beat up, right? Absolutely not. Because there's something that happens on a deeper level with shame. It's almost offensive to even say or think that out loud. But I'm trying to tell you what you already know, but that we don't believe. We, we already know that. If it's just physical, then how come I get young man after young man meet me in my office or call me on the phone and say, Jay, I'm struggling with pornography. But I never got one call from a young person that said, Jay, I'm struggling with lying. They're both physical. They're both sin. How come one is absolutely destroying your life and the other is just because it's more than that? If you look at the way God created women in Adam, it'll make sense to you. He said, you are bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Flesh is on the outside. Where's bone? On the inside. You know what he's saying? Before you come together, know that when you come together, it's something that happens on the outside and the inside of you. Sex is something that happens physically, but it also happens on the inside of you. It also happens emotionally, and it also happens spiritually. And so many people's lives have been stripped because of this topic, because of what it's done on the inside. And I want to redeem that today. I want to see God heal you today. I believe God's going to set some people free today. If you believe that, say amen. So in order to do that, we got to go to God's original design for sex and then try and pick up the playbook where he left it. So first, I'm going to talk to my single people. Single people, where yeah. Wow, single people. So sad. There we go. <laughs> she in the back. Single people, where you at? Come on. All right, good. I'll talk to you first, and then I'm going to talk to married people, because there's a design for single people, and there's a design for married people. My last point of single people deals with both. Single people, you got to understand this, that sex was designed to come at last. It's got to be at last. I wouldn't make that a point if so many people weren't trying to put it at first. You meet somebody, they look good, they look at you, they think you look good, and you got a place, and you got a time, and so, you know what, let's do this. I mean, after all, before you buy a car, you got to do a test drive. <laughs> this is the logic. So we're going to kick the tires on this thing to make sure this thing works, this is enjoyable, and trust me, it's enjoyable, you don't have to test the logic on that. It'll work. Okay? It's, don't, don't miss this. I, I like to, when I study the Bible, I ask questions all the time. It's one of the best ways to study the Bible, mind you. Ask questions to things that don't make sense. Here's one question I asked when I was reading the whole creation story. I'm like Mr. Efficient. Like, if I can't do it efficiently, I won't do it. I'm going to figure out a way to do it efficiently. Wouldn't it have been more efficient to just create Adam and Eve at the same time? I think it would have. If I'm God and I'm trying to get this thing done, I got seven days, you know, I'm a, I'm going to try and get it done at the same time. But God didn't do that. He created Adam, catch this, and then he made Adam wait and then brought sex. What if a part of the design of sex is waiting? Nobody wanted to hear that. <laughs> what if a part of the design for sex is waiting? Waiting for what, JJ? Well, I know it might sound a little conservative. I know it might sound a little outdated. I know it might sound a little bit traditional. But I believe what we're waiting for is marriage. Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 5, 15. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Man, God, why would you say that? You're trying to keep me from having fun? No. Look at verse 16. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets having sex with just anyone? Focus on that word spill. He's not trying to keep you from having fun. He's trying to keep you from getting hurt. The, the verb there is spill. The emphasis on this passage is spill. I don't want you to spill it. I don't want you to lose it. I don't want you to waste it. 
I want you to hold it and I want you to wait for it. So God in your favor wants you to wait for three things. The first thing he wants you to wait, this is why God wants you to wait. Are you ready? Because he wants you to have the best sex. Yeah, yeah. Not mediocre sex, not average sex, not just good sex. God wants you to have the best sex. And the best sex is, happens after waiting. My wife and I went on a 21-day fast. You guys know we all did it together in our church. It was a great time. Um, we fasted uh, food, some types of food. We fasted uh, TV. We fasted social media. And a lot of people don't know this, but we also fasted sex. For 20... <laughs> one days. And I need to confess something to you today. We did not make it. Day somewhere around day 17, we felt the peace of the Lord. We felt, we felt the Holy Ghost just go, hmm, and then we're like, I mean, God, if you say so, we'll step into your will, your perfect will. I was like, you feel good? I feel good. I feel like we did what we came here to do with the Lord. I feel like we knocked this down. And I'm not trying to get too vulgar. I just want to tell you, that night was a good night. And, I, and, and a part of what made it so great was the what? The waiting. This is why we love Christmas. Because after a sucky year, on December 25th, six days before you ever have to do it again, hope is renewed because you get gifts. A tree, it's beautiful, we love it. Those people who say, I wish Christmas could be all, day long, all year long. No, you don't. What makes it special is the waiting. God wants you to have the best sex. Number two, God doesn't just want you to have the best sex. God wants you to have the best sex with the best person. Genesis 2, 18 through 19. Read this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man. Again, I'm asking questions. When you study the Bible, ask questions. God, you're preparing Adam for, for intimacy. You're preparing Adam for sex. You're preparing Adam for his spouse. You're preparing a spouse for his spouse. Why are you bringing wild animals up into the mix at the beginning? What does that have to do with this? You got to ask that question. Because then it says, no helper was found, and then he made Eve. Here's my theory on it. I can't prove it, but I believe it. When I read the Bible, it's the only thing that makes sense to me. I think that God was trying to teach one spouse, in this case Adam, the difference between a woman and a wild animal. I think that he brought one animal and he was like, Adam, what do you think? And Adam was like, well, she got long hair. I like that. I like it. And uh, she's so graceful the way she, I like, I like that. I like that. Her nails are very strong. She could probably help me in the garden do some work here because it's a lot of work. And so I, I like it. And then God was like, that's good, but that's not a woman. That's a vulture. <laughs> and when you sleep, she will take all your money. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> and then the woman, now in the woman's turn, the woman gets up there. And this didn't happen biblically, but it probably was like this. is how God does in our life. The woman gets there, and then and another animal comes. And then, and then she's like, and God's like, what do you think, Eve? And she's like, mm, I like it. I like it. He looks, he looks well fed. He looks like he knows how to relax. I need a guy who knows how to just chill and that can calm me down and relax and just chill. It looks like he's got big pockets. You know, I like, that's good, Eve. That's not a man. That's a pig. And then, and then he brought the next one. And Eve was like, ooh, I like that one. I like how he's always playing with me. I like how he can't keep his paws off me. I like how he's always licking me. And then God was like, I'm sorry, Eve. That's not, that's not a husband. That's a dog. Hey, God's trying to teach you the difference between a good husband and a dog. And then the fella, the guy was there, and he was like, well, let me get in on this. I like this one. She looks so mysterious. Got a little red on her belly. That's good. Is that where the baby come out? I like that. And God's like, mm-mm, that's not, that's not a wife. That's a black widow. She will sleep with you, but then she will eat you after she sleeps with you. <laughs> Ladies, that's not a father. That's a chicken. 
And I know he said he goes to church, and I know he said he read his Bible, and I know he can quote scripture, but that's not a saint, that's a snake. And you got to learn to tell the difference between a man and a wild animal, between a woman and a wild, well, how am I going to know, Jay? They look all good. You wait. That's how you know. You wait and see how he treats his mama. I'm preaching way better. than You, you got to wait and see how he pays off his debts. You got to wait and see how she gets around other dudes. You got to wait and see how they live their life. Don't spell it out on an animal when God's got a man and a woman for you waiting. Learn to tell the difference between the animals and the one that God has for you. But you can't do that if you don't wait and see. You got to wait. You look good now, but how do you, what's your diet like? What do you eat? <laughs> what are the things that you ingest into your soul? What are the things that you ingest? What are your habits? Do you stay or are you, are, are you a traveler? Are you willing to be planted or do you got to move every 10 years or 10 days or five, whatever, you know? <laughs> you got to wait and see. You got to wait and see. And here's the last one. I think God wants you to, to, to wait, single people, and even this is for married people too, because I think he wants you to learn how to say no now. Because you're going to need that tool when you get married. Oh, yeah. Here was the biggest lie for me. Married people, I don't know if you can back me up on this. But when I was single and I was struggling with my sexual urges, I always taught myself this. Once I get married, no more urges. Go have sex every day. It's going to be great. I'm not going to have any struggles anymore. Can I tell you something about marriage? Every struggle that you don't solve in your singleness, you bring into your marriage and it's amplified. It's even worse. How does that even work? Because when you're not married, hopefully, you're not having sex. When you're not having sex, it's just, it's just off. It's just kind of off. You're not using it often. You're not engaging in it often. So your, your muscle memories, your mental memories, your, it's just not being exercised regularly. So it's not that you don't have desires, but you're not practicing it regularly. So in a way, it kind of is a little bit dormant. But when you start getting married and you start having sex, you're feeding those desires. And whatever desires you have when you're single, here's what I'm trying to tell you, ladies. If he can't keep his hands off you now, when y'all get married, how, what makes you think he's going to be able to keep his hands off his coworker? If you're struggling with pornography now, don't for a moment think that when you get married, now that you're married, you won't wrestle with pornography because she don't look like the girl on the screen. He don't look like the guy on the screen. I'm trying to warn you now, single people. There are things that you need to fix now, that you need to figure out now. Marriage is not the solution to that. You're going to bring it in it and it's going to exacerbate it because now you got someone who's attached to you and now everything you do, they feel. There's going to be pain in that. And so you got to figure it out now. How do I figure it out? I'm glad you said, here's how you get over it. Are you ready? Here's the, can we, can we zoom in here real quick? Closer. 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 <laughs> Boom. <laughs> this is a magnet. I'm going to go like fifth grade. This is a magnet. This is sin. This is you. You are a safety pin. <laughs> because you think that you're safe. <laughs> here's, here's, here's what I've learned. Here's why we keep getting stuck on sin. Are you ready? Not because we love it, but because we don't mind getting close to it. And so we're like, I don't, I don't like sin. But I do like slipping in and out of people's DMs. Doo, 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 doo. I don't like sin. But I do like, I love my movies with some nudity in it. I mean, if I can't have sex, I should be able to at least watch other people have sex. Do, 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 do. I, I don't like sin, but uh, oh, this is for the husbands, you know. Oh, now, babe, are you kidding? I don't like her. She's just an ex-girlfriend from Facebook. Do, 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 do. But you don't understand that there's things inside of you and inside of sin that are naturally drawn together. And the closer you get and the closer you get, eventually, and there's so many people stuck on sin. Not because they can't get over sin. They can't stop getting close to sin. It, it's, they hate this, but they keep... Get, you got to set rules for your life. I wear glasses, if you can't tell. And I can't see without them that well. I go to the gym often, if you can't tell. And, you know, the gym nowadays, just for the fellas out there, I feel you. We got to have it in control. We got to be able to control ourselves, but... You know, two words. I tell my wife this all the time. She knows yoga pants. Yoga pants are the thing in the gyms. 
And she knows. I come home and I be like, babe. And I just run it by her, you know, because I'm like, I need you to know, okay? And do um, you know when I go to the gym, this is just me. I'm not telling y'all, just me. When I go to the gym, I leave my glasses at home. I can't see a thing at the gym. <laughs> I don't care. I'll be on the weights. I'll be like, is this 25 or 35? I don't know. What's this? What's that? No, that's too heavy. That's too heavy. Not him? Okay, that's the one. That's the one. Can I get a spot? Can I get a spot, please? I can get, I can get to my places by memory. Because I just see my head down. I just eight pieces. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. Left turn. Boom, five, boom. Okay, this is the bench. I'm just there. Hey, you say, well, Jay, you're so legalistic. And, and Jay, you're such a really, you're such a Pharisee. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm telling you that's what I have to do. Because I need to set up. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Run from sexual sin. Not, not walk from it. Not skip, not hop, not skedaddle. Run. That's me running. That's me saying, I'm not going to let nobody get in the way of our marriage. That's me saying, I'm not going to let the devil steal my ministry and steal my church. That's me saying, these are the rules that I need for my life. Now, here's the thing. You got to set up rules for your life. I can't tell you what they are, but you got to set up rules for your life. For your life. All right. What if, what, if, what if I messed up the plan? Oh, married people. Got to get to married people. Wow. <laughs> Woo. First Corinthians. Sex is designed for married people to be long-lasting. Long-lasting, long-lasting, long-lasting. First Corinthians 7.1. Long-lasting. And here's what I mean by long-lasting. I mean, it's supposed to last your whole life. It's not supposed to get boring. It's not supposed to get old. It's not supposed to get tired. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now getting down to the questions you asked in your letter to me first. Is it a good thing to have sexual relations? Certainly. Paul's saying amen. But only within a certain context. It is good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balance of fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. Verse 3. The husband, I'm talking to married people, should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. Babe, take notes. Verse 4. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. I like that. And the husband gives authority over his body to the wife. I'm all yours. <laughs> Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. <laughs> but let me do it. Let me do it. You don't mess it up. Unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to the prayer. But afterward, you should come together so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Why does the Bible have to tell husbands and wives to have sex? I mean, I can understand the Bible telling us to tithe. I can tell, because that would be hard. I can understand the Bible telling us to love our enemies. Does the Bible really need to tell us to have sex? And if you're asking that question, here's one thing I know about you right away. You are single. <laughs> I know that about you. Because believe it or not, this is going to blow your mind. If you're in your 20s or if you're not married, this is going to blow your mind. There are things that I do now as a 33-year-old that my 14-year-old self would beat me up for. Bedtime. I think if my 14-year-old self could see me putting myself to bed at 9 p.m., he would punch me in the face. <laughs> he would be like, what are you doing right now? You, you had to go to bed early every day of your life because you're now that you can actually do it on your own, you're going to go. Yeah. Here's the other thing he would beat me up for, having a cupboard full of candy and not eating it. <laughs> he beat me up for that before dinner. He beat me up for that. Here's the other thing that he would beat me up for, my 14-year-old going through puberty self would beat me up if he saw me right now. Single people, you're not going to get it. Uh, in your 20s, you're not going to get it. But married people, you better back me up on this. He he's, he's, would never understand me going to bed with a beautiful woman to my side. Sex not being a sin because we're married. Because I grew up in church, and that was a thing. And me not having sex with her that night. 14-year-old me would be like. I don't understand that. Because I'm tired. Because we decided to watch three seasons of a just okay show. Help me out, married people. Fourteen-year-old me would drop kick me to the sternum. What are you doing? And listen, I know it's hard. I live that life. I know things get busy and things get. But listen, if two become one, 
through the act of sex, then that means when we don't have sex, it's really easy for the one to become two. The first thing that goes in a marriage is not the communication, it's the sex. On behalf of God to your marriage, have more sex. You need to have more sex. How much? I don't know, bro. Don't bring me that much in. I mean, I don't think it's like Tylenol, one in the morning, one at night. I don't think it's like that. But, but, but do something. You got to have more because it's how you stay together. It's how you stay one. So let me give you two practical ways to do it. Number one, you got to be intentional. What does that mean? I don't know. It's different everybody. Maybe you got to schedule it. You know, open up your calendar. But are you good Thursday, 7 I'm good. All right, let's get that down. You laugh, but that might be what you have to do. And some of you say, well, you know, I don't want to schedule it because when I schedule it, you know, it's, uh, it's not romantic anymore. Okay, well, two things. One, how's that working for you? And two, you don't want to schedule it, but if you were going to have an affair, you would schedule that. You would book the hotel room. You would pay in advance. You would make plans for the kids. You would do everything you had to do to have some alone time. So let's do it if it matters. And then two, listen, if sex is the, it's the physical result and sex is, is, is emotional and spiritual, that means you might have to guard your spiritual and emotional life to get back to that place. You gotta have date night regularly. You gotta have date night regularly. You gotta make sure that the love is still going in order to experience it there. All right, final point. Sorry that we're going over, but is this helping anybody? I hope so. I can finally start talking about this bed that you've been wondering why it's up here for so long. I, 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 there are people here today who say, JJ, I've deviated from that plan. Sex before marriage? Yeah, i am kind of been past that boat. In my marriage right now, I got to struggle. My wife has no idea, JJ. I'm, I'm, I'm not in this plan right now. I need your help. If, if you're here today and you're struggling, listen, you're probably struggling with the shame of the last time. The last time, you know. The last time you, you broke God's heart. The last time you did something that you were ashamed about sexually. The last time someone did something to you. Or how about these? How about this? I remember this being a teenager. Maybe my, my journey youth up there can resonate with me. Maybe some of the adults too. You do something and then after you do it, you tell the Lord, God, this is the... But it wasn't, was it? It wasn't, was it? And now we got the shame. And that's a problem because look what the Bible says in Genesis 2.25. Now the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Sex is not supposed to be shameful. This bed is not supposed to be something that brings shame. They were naked and they felt no shame. Do you know, I don't know if you know this, but sex is designed to be had naked. Yeah. Sex was designed to be had naked. And here's why. Because sex, what makes sex special isn't an orgasm. What makes sex special is the intimacy. Because you're opening yourself up to a person and you're laying it all out. They're seeing all of you and they're accepting all of you and you're accepting all of them. What makes it special is the intimacy. But when we sin sexually or when someone sins sexually against us, guess what we do? We cover up. We cover up. Because we don't want them to see the things that we're ashamed about. And we cover, and we cover, and we cover. Now imagine, some of you single people, you got to get free from this. Why? Because one day you're going to get married, and your spouse is going to walk in the, in the honeymoon suite. And they're going to say, you ready? I'm ready. You ready? And you're going to go, I'm ready. Let's have sex. <laughs> and you might have sex, but you won't have intimacy. I wanted this image to burn in your mind. A bedroom covered. This is so many of us today. Married people, same thing. Why? Because you know the Greek word for covered is kruptos. And the other word for, for, for covered, are you ready? Same word, it means secrets. We're covering up with secrets. Single people, you got secrets. Nobody knows what you're going through. Nobody knows what happened to you. Married people, there are husbands and wives in this room right now struggling with pornography like struggling. And the crazy thing is, your spouse don't know, so you cover it up to protect you. But what you cover to protect you is now imprisoning you. Because now no matter what, you won't take it off. Now you're stuck. Now you're having sex, but you're not really feeling it. You're not really connecting. 
How do I do it, Jay? How do I get off? How do I get this off of me? How do I have intimacy once again? How do I get healing? How do I break free? How do I come out of the shame? There's only one way. It's time to take off the secrets. I'm thinking about that couple right now. When you leave church today, you need to have that conversation with your spouse. You don't know this, but it's been years, and I'm tired of being a slave to it. I wrestle with this thing, and I'm I'm looking for healing, and I'm going to go get counseling, and we're going to work this out, but single people, before you get married, you need to get in a small group, someone you can trust, a friend. This is what happened to me when I was younger. This is the stuff that I've been wrestling with right now. The only way is to take it off and get naked. But what if my wife leaves me after she knows what I did? What if the things that happen to me make me unlovable or unnatural? What if my shame leads to rejection? It could happen. But if that happens, I want you to know it's okay. Because I know somebody who doesn't reject you. I know somebody who accepts you just the way you are. With everything that happened to you and everything that you've done to other people, He knows you naked. He knows you buck naked, inside and out. And he says, I love you, and I'm ready to free you. You know, the Bible says that Jesus hung on a cross naked, that they stripped off his clothes, and they divided them, and they played dice over them. I have a friend. This is my final story. We'll close. I have a friend who has a twin sister, and they went to the beach one day, and he saw his twin sister coming out of the pool. A wave hit her, and when the wave hit her, the top of her bathing suit was starting to come off. He saw it on slow motion. He's on the other side of the ocean. So he looks, the rest of the church is out there. It's like a church beach trip. The rest of them is out there. And then when he shows what happened in slow motion, he goes, hey, everybody, look at me. <laughs> look at me. Look over here. Look at me. Look at me. He wanted to save her shame. Eyes on me. You know, the devil right now, I can hear his voice. It's even hard to get through the preaching because even as I'm speaking, he's throwing everything at you. Everything you ever did, everything that's ever been done to you, every way that you fail as a wife or a husband, every way you failed as a single person, every way you failed as a divorcee, every way you failed. And I want you to know the reason why Jesus Christ died on a cross and died naked on a cross was so that he could look the devil in the eye and say, everything you're saying is true, but don't look at her, look at me. Don't look at him, look at me. But look what happened to me when I was seven. Don't look at that. Look at me. But my uncle touched me when I was just a child. Don't look at that. Look at me. But this happened. My virginity was stolen from me. Don't look at that. Look at me. But I feel dirty. Don't look at that. Look at me. But I feel used. Don't look at that. Look at me. But I don't feel like I have anything to offer a relationship. Don't look at that. Look at me. But I feel guilty. And I feel shame. And I feel naked. Don't look at that nakedness. Look at me. I hung on this cross for you. Don't look at your chains. Look at the holes in my hands. Don't look at the struggles in your mind. Look at the crown of thorns on my head. I got you, daughter. I got you, son. And he's standing on that cross today. Stay standing. And he's saying, look at me. Forget about your past. Look at me. I'm here. Hello. Eyes off of what you did when you were 17. Eyes off of your last marriage. Eyes off of your addiction. Eyes off of the pornography. On here, right here. I know what you did, but look what I did. This is the gospel story. One last verse, and we'll worship, and freedom is going to come over this place right now. First Peter 3.18, one last verse. That's what Christ did definitively. That word means once and for all. Suffered because of other sins. The righteous one for the unrighteous ones. He went through it all. Was put to death and then made alive to bring us to God. And they felt no shame. Next verse. Not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything. And every one, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you did, Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone. And here is what he says, he says clean, he says forgiven, he says restored, he speaks virginity, he speaks wholeness, he speaks restoration. The 
last word. Come on, let's pray right now. Let's lift our hands. Here's what I want to see in our worship. Everybody who is covered as we begin to worship, here's what we're telling the world. And here's what we're telling God. No more covers. No more secrets. Today I'm coming in your presence. Here I am with every bad thing I've ever done. With every bad thing that's ever happened to me. And I stand naked in your presence. Come on, let's pray. Father, we love you. We're coming to your presence today. And we pray for rest. Thank you so much for watching. Don't let the journey stop here. We'd love for you to do one of three things. Either subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry blessed you at all, subscribe so that you can find out when the next video comes out. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to support us financially, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for your time. God bless.